Uh, as you can hear, this meeting is being recorded. A um, couple of things before we start. As you could hear in the intro, uh, we're raising funds to uh, support students in need. We have already um, helped really quite a number of international students and we're hoping to help many more. So uh, please consider our, um, our request. But uh, now we'll go on to uh, today and uh, we'll have a few um, house rules as they say. First of all, uh, please mute your um, uh, settings. That would be greatly appreciated. Also, if you can just uh, let, uh, show us your face and uh, put on your video because it's nice to see people look at you, looking at you and uh, not see these black screens. So that would be appreciated too. Please switch off your mobile phone because we find that sometimes the phone, mobile phones interfere with the, um, the webinar, the broadcasting. Um, I think that's it for house rules. And then I'll go over to the speaker of today. And we're very uh, happy and delighted to announce the speaker of today. It's Hannes Data. Hannes works as a um, associate professor of marketing at our um, marketing department. And maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but this marketing department that he works in is one of the world leading marketing departments, ranking very highly in, uh, in the research world. So that's great that he is, uh, he is willing to give this webinar today. Uh, Hannes works on uh, research in the area of digital media. So things like digital TV or streaming. And today he's gonna tell us more about his hub. So I'm not going to uh, waste any more time Honest, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thanks for the invite. It's, it's really an honor to be speaking to, to alumni of, of uh, Tilburg University. It's actually, I think, the first time uh, speaking to this group. So um, uh, I, I think you can all see my screen. Is that correct? Uh, you can use the chat or you cannot. Um, uh, we'll make this a very interactive session. So actually, I, I monitor the, uh, the chat all the time. Um, so today I talk about um, what uh, I learned yeah. about, Hans, could you, excuse uh, me, there was... Uh, yeah, sorry, could you start the screen share, please? Like, of course I can. Ah, uh, thank you, yeah, perfect. There you go, there you go, thank you, uh, thank you. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to talk to you about what I learned um, in terms of managing data and computation intensive research projects. And um, my slides are available um, at uh, um, our site. Um, it's, it's called tilburgsciencehub.com slash slides. So I invite you all um, to, I mean, join me on that deck and you can uh, click on the links if you find certain things that are interesting and, and you can actually explore more than um, what I'm telling about right now. Um, this is the agenda for today. So uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce um, myself a little bit to you in case uh, you don't know me yet um, but I also would like to know uh, who you are and what you're currently working on in order to be uh, uh, able to uh, um, uh, 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 let's say kind of personalize what, what I'm talking to you about today so uh, to, to make sure that it's very uh, relevant to you and then um, I spent most of the time about a few key building blocks of efficient workflows and what workflow really means, I'm, I'm going to get at that. So uh, bear with me for a moment. And then I'll wrap up and I have some tips um, on how I can help you with the implementation of what I'm uh, telling um, you uh, today. So uh, first, uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I uh, did my PhD at Maastricht University uh, back seven years ago uh, in quantitative marketing. And I joined Tilburg um, yeah, seven years ago and I'm associate professor now. And as uh, Frederic said, I'm interested in the digitization broadly and subscription-based business models. So I have a bunch of projects on, on, um, uh, on online music streaming, um, uh, uh, for instance, uh, about how music consumption changes when users adopt Spotify. But I'm also broadly interested in marketing mix modeling um, and branding, you know, some of those topics that you would generally associate with marketeers. But I must warn you, this session is not about marketing today. It's about something else. So, um, but before I really get into the topic, I, I'd actually like to know, uh, what's your link to Tilburg? Um, so um, I'll, I'll issue a poll for you guys. Um, so it would be awesome if you could let me know um, your graduation year um, at Tilburg. Um, so um, a couple of more recent graduates, which probably already brings me, you know, 
to my uh, actually that's my third question but actually I'm very curious on whether there are like any former students of mine in this uh, in this thing so if, if, if you are you could put your name in the chat and uh, and I'd be happy actually to see some of my my prior students all right so uh, we have a cohort of, of very recent graduates so that's cool uh, because probably you're in a in a in a, in a um, you know maybe still somewhat junior function uh, compared to um, uh, compared to other people uh, that may be here, uh, which um, gives you the ability to uh, 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 use many of the things that I'm talking to, uh, 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 th that I will talk about, um, because you will probably work still operationally. So um, that's actually a, a very cool thing. And um, I would also like to know, um, uh, to give me a, a, an idea on which programs you've graduated from. Um, and please put that in the chat, because I need to know, are you like data scientists? Are you marketeers? Are you maybe not even from the business and economics world like I am. So, oh, marketing analytics, Mitch, that's great. So you're from my program, economics. Okay, good. Um, cool. Um, oh, Ingo, that's great that you're here. Ingo is a former student of mine. Cool. So we got a bunch of marketeers. Um, uh, yeah, people from the business. Okay, that's a good, that's a good thing. So, um, and you can also maybe put in the chat like where you're working right now and why you think today this will be relevant for you or why did you actually join the session that'll help me to to kind of um, uh, move on so what is the motivation for this class and i will not monitor the chat for like maybe like three minutes but please put your stuff there and I'll, i'm reading it in a bit so so i'm doing quantitative work that means like i work a lot with like big data sets um, and uh, when I did my PhD, I, I, I was coding a lot. I, I prepared um, large data sets and, and um, I estimated econometric models, but I really didn't learn about how to structure my work. So I just did everything by intuition. And um, that actually created a complete chaos um, in this first project. And um, today I will show you that chaos. And you know, if you have my slides, once again, that's available at tilburgsciencehub.com slash slides. I think it's the first thing in the chat, but I'm putting it on there again. Um, you can actually check out how my project directory looked like at this particular point in time, which you can see on the screen. So um, this is a paper which got published in one of the you know, uh, uh, most uh, reputable um, journals in our field. Um, so I did very good work here, but how I got at this work was you know, maybe not the most efficient way. So for instance, if you look at my folder structure, I have um, a folder called code. Well, probably that stores the code for my project. Um, but then there is another subfolder. It says new data preparation. Hmm. So actually, I don't know. What is the code that I ran for this project? Is it the code in uh, code or is it the code in new data prep? But then um, there is also um, something called Sarah content. Sarah used to be a big computer that I used when I estimated these models. And I have different model runs here and different versions of the same code files. And I, I, I kind of like versioned them with version numbers, but I don't actually know what that means anymore. So actually I'm unable to find back um, the code that I used to estimate um, my model. Um, and I'm not even able to really get at the data set that I at that time used to run my stuff. And um, that arguably is not a very efficient way to um, run your project. So this is kind of um, where I'm starting from it, which is my motivation. Uh, I need to go back to my slides. Oh, there we go. So um, what was so bad about this? Well, I can reproduce the results whenever I wanted to, even while I was working on this project. And then second, it was completely inefficient. So when making changes to my data or the model, I had to go back to the very beginning, repeating all of those steps. So um, actually I'll, I'll show you real quick. Um, so let me just open this in a new tab so I don't lose it. So at this data preparation, I have like certain files, right? So files to prep my advertising data, uh, one of those files actually compare, uh, you know, prep my, my customer data. Um, then I have some marketing data, like direct marketing data that I was reading in. But actually, I don't know. I mean, even if I know which file I used, I don't know 
in what order I actually executed these files. So that will take me like a very long time to like, you know, understand how that was done. Um, and then a colleague at Tilburg asked me um, uh, maybe like two, three years ago um, to share this data because she wanted to use it for an ongoing project, which by the way, recently got published. And uh, it took me a very long time to dig out actually the data set that, that, that she needed to have because nothing was like properly documented. And I didn't learn about this. Actually, you know, I thought I was doing a good job because I did everything by intuition. But, you know, as I know now, I didn't do a good job. So why should you care? Um, you will also change your code continuously while working on the project. And maybe even if you're like honest with yourself, many of the things that you do may be like not automated. Um, you still do things manually, like, I don't know, opening Excel and saving an Excel file, like, you know, to CSV and then opening up that in your statistical software. So uh, that is not good practice. And also colleagues will uh, probably have a look at your code too, um, because maybe they want to help you. Um, or if you leave the company, um, they need to continue with your code base. Um, uh, by the way, that recently happened to, to, to somebody new. Uh, she was taking over a job of somebody else. And you know, now you have to kind of you know, understand that code base that was written. And I can promise you that the, even the small efficiency gains of uh, what I'm going to talk about today um, will pay off very soon. And now we'll um, spend like a few seconds uh, reading about um, your current functions. Um, so I got a, another former student of mine. So hi, that's cool that you're here. Um, I got um, I got core in, uh, so financial risk modeling consultant. That's cool. Um, process building. Yeah, good. Um, so. Yeah, we got a couple of people, but it's really sense, uh, hard to sense from the chat how advanced the stuff that you do is already. So I'll just um, um, continue. So this short class is, um, and that's my learning objective, I want to show you a few, and the emphasis is on a few, ways to increase your um, efficiency when working on data and computation intensive projects. And I'm going to define all of those terms uh, on the next few slides. So what do I mean with um, efficiency? And I have like a slide on what's efficient and what's not efficient in my view. Um, and what's efficient is if you don't make mistakes, but frankly, everybody does mistakes. It's also efficient to catch mistakes early. Um, so, uh, I mean, in, in my projects, it once happened to me that I, that, I caught a, that I caught something very late and that, you know, costs a lot of time down the road. So, I mean, you probably all agree with me that catching mistakes early is, is important or catching mistakes at all. You know, probably in this, you know, paper that I showed you before, probably there's still a mistake somewhere in that code just because I wasn't coding very good at that point in time. Um, what's also very efficient is if you can bring down the setup cost of restarting a project. So, um, as an academic, we uh, work, on, um, work on projects and then we write up our paper and send it out for review. And then we have to wait and depending on the journal that can take about like three, three months, uh, I think that's, that's, that's a good estimate. And then you get the work back and you need to address the comments of the review team. And uh, what happens many times in between is that you actually forget how you did your project, right? You know, I mean, in what order files had to be executed, what is the most recent variable that you used, so um, the tips that, that we are sharing um, here uh, in this presentation, but also on tilburgsciencehub.com, um, uh, help you to bring down these costs. They're not zero, but um, they, um, they are much lower than if you didn't do what we, what we advocate here. And another really cool thing of what efficiency is, if you can prototype the final product and refine it later. So I wanna give you an example. So I work on a project right now in which I try to assess um, what I call platform power versus the um, power of digital content owners. So if you think about the music industry, uh, that's an industry where I'm like uh, doing a lot of research in. You have Spotify, which is a platform, and you have the content providers, which are um, um, labels, music labels that put stuff on Spotify, like you know, Universal, Warner, Sony, these are like the major labels. And in this project, I want to estimate um, um, who's more powerful on, on the digital platform? Is it Spotify, the owner of the platform? You may think they are, right? Because they own the store. Or is it actually the suppliers of that content? And we quantify that power. You know, 
that's interesting. But what's even more interesting is to see in which categories of music consumption um, the uh, power is larger or smaller. So, um, for example, um, the most traditional music categories that, that probably you can also think of are like genres, right? You have pop, you have rock, you have hip hop, EDM. This is a very established. But what you see on streaming platforms is so that they also have new categories like workout music or sleep music or music that you can use to concentrate while working. Uh, you may be familiar with these kind of categories. So you may wonder, uh, are there differences in terms of this power in these categories? All right. So th that's like essentially the setup here. But in my data, I don't observe categories and I use a machine learning algorithm to learn these categories from data but I just didn't have that much time yet to invest a lot of work into this algorithm. So what I did is I built a prototype algorithm. It's simple, K means clustering, it's like off the shelf stuff. And what I get out is okay, but I wanna work on it later on. But I have a co-author who also wants to work on my project. And you know, to make like progress, my co-author needs to already have some kind of classification in there. So what we did is we built a very simplistic clustering algorithm, but we built the entire pipeline. So like our whole data preparation is done and also like this clustering algorithm is run in between and the output um, can be like passed to the next stage and my co-author can work with this data. Um, that's very efficient because my co-author can already make progress on the project while I'm still like refining and fine tuning the algorithm. Will it change much of the results? I don't think so. If I like get better categories, it will not change the results dramatically, but um, at least we can work in parallel that way. So what I mean to say here is it's efficient if you can build an entire pipeline, which builds your entire project already, and then you can uh, refine the steps in between to make it better. Um, Rotating on task is also extremely efficient. So um, with me, it's like switching between projects. Uh, you know, if I uh, get kind of brain dead on one project, I can like start my work on another project. And because I have zero setup costs to switch, that's very good. And sharing and reusing code is also like a good idea. So if your code is written in a way that other people can look at it and use it actually, that's great because they make find bucks and tell you about it. Um, and that is maybe the last point. Have others audit your code. So I started um, to release my code on, on GitHub, uh, either code snippets um, or, or um, entire projects. And sometimes I get comments from people saying like, look, you overlooked something here. I think this should be the right thing. So one example from my work is I use um, an algorithm to classify label names, music label names into their parent labels. So I can learn that a particular label is part of Sony, Warner, or Universal. I need that for my research project, right? And I just put up that algorithm. And it turns out a firm uh, from Silicon Valley who is into data analytics uh, started using my algorithm to uh, benchmark their own data on whether their own data is correct. But they also shared their own list with me. And now we can both improve that algorithm. And it's just because we um, started being a little more open in sharing algorithms and data. So that's a win-win. It's a win-win for them because they can better, you know, identify these labels. And it's a great win for me because that's what my research project is about. Okay. I'm spending a lot of time on those slides, but um, I, think, I think it's important to give you a few examples here. What's not efficient? Waiting. I hate waiting. I'm very impatient. Uh, and I've seen some colleagues here on the stream who will probably agree I'm a very impatient person. And um, so um, waiting for results or waiting for estimations. And the bad thing about waiting is that I personally get distracted. So when I wait more than 10 seconds for something to show up on my screen, I'll start looking at my smartphone, I start looking at my email, and then actually I lose, the, I lose my flow. Um, what's also inefficient is if you forget how things are done or were done, you know, um, that means like historically in a project or in the current project losing data, I think you all agree that's something very inefficient. And using code which isn't properly documented, uh, you know, you don't really know how to use it once it comes out of it. And, and um, yeah, and when you feel you lost kind of the oversight in a project, that's also not a good thing. Um, so this all is important in any kind of project, I think, but it aggravates in data and computation intensive projects. So when I talk about data intensive projects, I mean 
um, hitting at least one of those four V's that defines big data, right? So if it's large data, so for example, when you have to prototype your um, um, project on a small data set, um, because like building your entire project on the large data set may take too long uh, of, of time. Um, the variety of data that you may use. So I've, I've talked to recent graduates of mine that, that join companies and um, they're just um, blown away by the amount of, of data sources that they will have to integrate. And uh, sometimes in these companies, how it happens is that you know, kind of manually take an extract here, manually do this, manually do that. And, and that's also um, uh, yeah, taking a lot of time and is potentially error prone. Many companies are also in the stage of uh, investing a lot in data cleaning. Um, uh, so uh, some of those companies that I'm talking to, they're, um, they're like in the stage of integrating different data sources from different departments and then making sure that these data pass the audit checks. Um, and uh, when a particular team has already invested a lot in, in cleaning up some particular data source, then that is also very efficient to share that with others uh, in the organization. And um, the last thing is sometimes you're building projects like predicting customer churn, for example, that you will redo over and over again. Um, or like generating an annual report on something, uh, whatever it may be, uh, you can fill in the gaps here for me. But um, it, it's, it's very inefficient doing that every year. And I know, I know many people that do that manually and it takes them a lot of time every year. Um, like customer churn predictions, just as another example, right? Um, people think like, yeah, let's do that like once a year, right? But I mean, you can do that every week in essence to update your stuff. And our workflows that I will present in a bit, they enable you to do that. Um, uh, and computation intensive, that's just like, it takes a lot of time to compute. Um, um, that's not so interesting. So um, I want to know, um, in your work right now, what do you feel has been like very efficient and what has been very inefficient? Do you like kind of recognize a few of the things that I that I that I pointed at? You may be also way more advanced than I am. That that's very well possible. So maybe maybe you discovered the holy grail. And you need to teach me. But like, what's the current state? So give me a couple of examples whether you recognize um, some inefficiencies or some 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 uh, some efficiencies that you've already generated in your projects. Does it kind of fit also the description? Are you working on big data projects? And you can also unmute your mic. There's not so much, uh, I mean, and, and, and tell me about it. That's also fine. Yes, so uh, Frederic is saying she's being delivered data over time that does not carry the same attributes, yes. Yes, that's very uh, inefficient. So probably also on the other you know, side, somebody is doing things manually. Um, and yes, version control helps. Um, uh, that's a good uh, argument. I have a couple of things on version control, I think on this deck too, which is part of this. Um, and structuring data, yes. Um, so what firm, uh, I, I don't know your first name. Uh, I just see Ye Melkas. Uh, what firm are you working on or, or like wh where are you at? I wanna place you, that helps me a bit. You could put, give me some background here. So what my learning objective was, right? I want to share a couple of tips and, and how to like kind of achieve my learning objectives is that I want to familiarize you with um, the, let's call it the Tilburg Science Up way of setting up projects. So I want to tell a little bit about Tilburg Science Up. So, um, my school, the Tilburg School of Economics and Management, seeks to professionalize um, the way research is done and also generate efficiencies there. And together with um, um, uh, Professor Toby Klein, I think he's also here in the stream, um, we um, received funding to um, make alive TilburgScienceHub.com as kind of a manual for, for students and researchers and entire teams of data scientists to um, yeah, increase their efficiency in collaborating with each other. So I have used um, this site in my teaching this year and um, that's, been, uh, that's been a very good experience. But this site is out there for everybody to use and currently we're like in this stage where uh, you know, we've built a couple of things um, and um, we're in the phase of we'd like to receive feedback and um, we wanna make it relevant for other people to use. 
I mean, it works very well for, uh, for our teams uh, of, of, of students and other researchers that we're working on, but we see there is more value to it. And um, that's why we kind of give this seminar and, and we hope to receive some feedback from your site. But we of course also hope that you can use it. And um, I think there's a batch of 100 uh, students uh, from the marketing analytics program coming that knows this stuff. So, um, so I think that's also a cool thing. So um, I have a disclaimer before I show you a couple of things. This is a very short class. I took like half an hour to set up my you know, introduction here. Um, it's, it, I can only deliver you a rough overview. Um, Tilburg Science Up seeks to provide you the deep dive, but you know, we're still working on the side. And um, so, you know, a few things may still be rough here and there. So, you know, if you have feedback, we're happy to, to hear that. Um, I want you to think of Tilburg Science Up more as Scrum um like a software product or a platform so to those that don't know scrum scrum is like a way in which like it teams manage um their projects uh, which i really like uh, uh, by the way so um in this discussions about topic science i've many times i've received the question yeah but do you need to log in and you know what is this a platform is this a software product no well it's just like a a collection of templates and workflows that we're sharing that have prov proven to be very efficient um, in our work. And probably it will be efficient in your work too. Um, and there are a couple of cool examples also about inefficiencies like typing manual queries and manual conversions to other programs. So I totally agree with those and we think we solve those. Um, I wanna tell you uh, because most of you work in businesses and are not researchers like I am, I don't use tools that are popular in business. You know, Power BI may do certain things that we do. Tableau may do certain things that we do, but um, we need a more flexible tool stack than these um, commercial software packages um, in order, for instance, to be able to transport our computations to the cloud where we don't have a Power BI license or we don't have a Tableau license or anything like that. So we use mostly open source software because that allows us to port something that we prototyped on our machine to a supercomputer and then run it in the same configuration. And then also, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not even a data scientist. I'm a marketeer that um, learned these things from co-authors. Um, I did a lot of reading myself. I developed many things myself, but um, uh, you know, um, if you talk to somebody who, who, who studied computer science and works in a software firm, they're probably gonna say like, duh, yeah, we do this all the time, right? But the point is we in business and economics research don't do it like this yet. At least, you know, some people do it, but not a broad group of people. And uh, at least when I talk to my, you know, uh, recent graduates, nobody in these firms uh, where they join does it that way. So, you know, maybe there's something to win here, but I don't really claim I've discovered the holy grail here. Um, I think other people have done that. Um, some things according may be very simple, but you know, some things may be very advanced um, for others. So depending on your level, um, just like we prototype these things on, on the car configuration I display on the screen. I think it also works for, for, for smaller projects anyways. Uh, it will also work a little bit for, for, for larger projects, but uh, we didn't build like pipelines that could, I don't know, replace the infrastructure of a Netflix or something. No, we're like interested. We are researchers. Our experience is from doing this for research. And that is where this has been proven very stable. So um, I don't know where you are at and what the scale of things is that you're building, but um, maybe you need to be a little cautious also here. And then I hope this is not a traditional lecture, so you can continue using the chat. Um, I, I hope I make this an interactive live stream. So the agenda of what I want to uh, spend my last half an hour with is uh, I want to share with you a couple of these workflows and I will show you one of the templates that we have in tailbooksignsup.com. And, um, you know, my wish is that you actually start using our site and this is how our site looks like. Um, you'll reach it at tailbooksignsup.com. Um, the site is going to be overhauled and we're going to change it probably in a bit, but um, the major sections are kind of, you know, probably staying the same. The first section explains you about all of our principles about how to set up workflows that are efficient and reproducible. And I'll give you a few highlights of this in a bit. The second section explains you about common setup procedures for software programs. Um, and the important thing is that the software is set up in a way so that it can be automatically called from scripts on your system. 
So for instance, when you open, um, well, I'll do this right now. If I open a terminal uh, on, my, on my Mac and I'll type um, R, actually R is being opened. If you do that and you haven't followed the instructions like, like we've given, that doesn't work. So the, the cool thing is if you do it and set up your computer that way, um, you can, um, let's say, kind of remote control your uh, software programs. Uh, and that is at the core of like automation, um, which you will um, uh, learn all about in, in just a bit. And we put, let's say, our software stack there. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, that's that. And then we have developed project templates and a tutorial uh, to teach you about these workflows. The project templates are like templates that you can just like download and put all your files in and adjust the files a little bit and then, then you should be good to go because they adhere to a kind of, you know, the workflow things that, that, we, uh, that, that we explain over here in this thing. Um, and for those uh, who need a little more guidance, um, um, uh, we recorded a tutorial. Uh, so, um, uh, and I will show you actually a few steps of this tutorial also. And like for each of those steps, we have like YouTube videos that explain you those things. And, you know, it's all, uh, you know, video production from my Zolder camera. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of how I use the, uh, the Corona time. And we got a bunch of tips and manuals um, on how to use particular software tools. Um, I will um, quickly spend like a few seconds reading the chat because there are a few things happening and I don't want to miss out on them. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I hope I can comment on this later, Corn. Um, so uh, let me go back to my deck and um, zoom in on what are these workflows that I'm talking about. And uh, maybe that's a little dry, but I hope you see the value of this, okay? So what we are building in our research project um, is, um, is pipelines. Uh, and I wanna explain that concept. So a pipeline refers to the usually automized steps necessary to build a project. And I sometimes use the word uh, word workflow interchangeably. So, um, for example, um, the steps necessary to prepare a data set, you've seen that in one of my old projects before, run a model, we'll produce our result tables and figures. Uh, so for me as a researcher, this is how a prototypical pipeline looks like. So um, I have stage one, that's prepare my data set for analysis. I download the raw data, I clean it, I aggregate it. And step two, you know, maybe somebody else works uh, on this uh, stage uh, in, in my project. So run a model on this data set, you know, have various variable configurations, select the best fitting model. And then stage three for me is like produce tables and figures for paper. That may look very different for you guys. If you're working like I've seen, like we got some financial modelers. So probably you got like, you know, stage one prepping the data set. Maybe you have like an auditing stage uh, to check whether your data is actually correctly prepared. That may be like something cool to do. You probably also have like a model that you do, a prototype model, but then stage three, maybe something like deployment in, in, life, in like life trading or something like that, right? So your model kind of gets packaged, um, you save like all parameter estimates, and then it's being shipped to other units of the firm that it actually use it for decision-making um, in, in the firm. Um, so, you know, the pipeline is like a variable um, concept. Uh, so whatever you're building, put it in like steps and then um, that's, that, that's your pipeline. And the, the thing is you want to automate it. Um, and um, it's a good idea also thinking about your pipeline in, in a project. So for instance, this is a prototypical, uh, prototypical pipeline um, that, uh, you know, for an academic paper. So maybe you have like raw data sources in Excel and you have like scripts that convert those to CSV files because then you can load them nicely into R and bind them together. It's like, I don't know, stacking them together. That's another rule. And then you have your final data set. And then you have two rules. One of those rules or, 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 or scripts, you know, produces your, your uh, regression results, your model results, and another few rules run, um, um, run some graphs on this. And then the last step of this process of this pipeline may be like, I don't know, to wrap these pictures and, and tables together into a PDF. Uh, but again, uh, I'm an academic, so I'm building papers, uh, but you may build very different things, but probably this, this concept may, may apply to you too. Um, the white boxes, your inputs and outputs. K 
can be both, right? So the output of one stage can be also the input of the next stage. And the red boxes are like the transformation that happens. So, so what is actually being done? And you can think of those as, as like script files, right? And these script files, they can also be, you know, used in different projects. So maybe I'm, I'm foreshadowing a bit. So I store all my code on GitHub, um, which is great because I have like a common platform where I can search all of the code I've written in my career. And I um, frequently go back to, to like previous stuff that I've written and, and I can just search for these things very, very, you know, very efficiently and plug them into my new project. So many of these rules that I've written, I can just like reuse over time. So that's some of the efficiency gains that I have. Um, so the benefits, if you think about pipelines of your work is you write clearer source code because you can, you know, um, kind of chunk your projects into smaller parts. So back in the days in my first project, I had like a giant script or like maybe 10 giant scripts, but you can break it down in like very, very small units, which then makes um, debugging very fast and also rebuilding your project very fast. Um, because the beauty of this is that the tools, the automation tools that, that we're using um, uh, enable you to automatically recognize which part of your process of your pipeline has already been built or not. So suppose the first, let's say, part of your pipeline takes two days to prep. And that's not unrealistic in like big data applications. So one project that I've been working on um, uh, uh, we work with, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, very raw. Yeah. I mean, we work with like a data set with, um, and then that's just 5,000 customers and we observe them over like a period of two years, but we have like second level estimates, uh, sorry, second level, um, information on what songs these consumers, um, um, listen to. And now we're trying to compare, uh, the music consumption between all of our consumers with all of the other consumers. So that's like 5,000 squared. And you know, you could say like 5,000, that's really not a, a large thing, but like, uh, you know, 5,000 squared, that is many computations to make. And that takes, you know, many hours um, uh, to do um, in, in our application. So it's very inefficient that if you just like want to reproduce some, some uh, regression outputs to run your whole workflow from beginning to end. So the tools that we're using, they kind of recognize what is the code that has changed? What are the inputs that have changed? And then it only builds the part of the project that um, you uh, that needs to be built. Um, that's this part, like obtain results faster, redo only the things that were changed. Uh, it increases transparency and col collaboration. You can work in different parts of the pipeline at the same time. And um, you can actually use a fully flexible software stack because to this tool that binds everything together, it doesn't matter whether something is in R, something is in Python, as long as it can be automized via the command line, you can use anything. So, you know, you can use whatever is best at its job. Um, and for me as a researcher, that's a very nice thing. Uh, and, you know, probably for you guys too. Um, what are common pipeline stages in your domain? So for me, it's data prep, model estimation, writing a paper. Give me a couple of, uh, couple of um, thoughts here on how you can break down your project. And maybe you can put some stuff in the chat. Uh, campaigns for donations. Uh, okay, so uh, what are the pipeline steps? That's your whole project. Yeah, so. How could you break it? So that's hard, but what we try to do is uh, that you have this big pool of people that you want to approach and then based off a couple of uh, attributes that you identify and that might be different every campaign, you try to uh, get a, uh, different segments and every segment has a different action. Yes. Yeah. So the segmentation, I think that's something you, that, that, that is one pipeline thing because the input changes every few months with these donation campaigns, but the algorithm that does your, your segmentation is probably the same, right? So yes. Um, maybe there's also a data cleaning step uh, involved, right? You're getting like raw data, maybe from your, from, from your telephone campaigns that, that the, the alumni, I think you're doing that, right? Not like quite sure, uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's a overseeable project in a way, but it certainly can be thought of as, you know, being broken down into, um, into pipelines. Um, and the results can change all the time. Maybe you can give me a few, uh, a few extra insights here. Um, 
What do you mean by that? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so uh, Lander is saying like the results of campaigns for donations can change all the time. Yes, but like the, this general segmentation step, of course you can improve it every time, right? But like that's like a like a building block in, in your project, which you can like make explicitly one one module in, in your in your pipeline. Um, and then also you need to think about the components of a pipeline. So these refer to a project's building blocks consisting of source code, data, generated files, and notes. Okay, so you probably all have written source code before, but what really is source code? What does it do? Actually, it takes some inputs. It can be like either data as an input or arguments as an input, then apply some transformation that you do in this code, and then it outputs something. It could be data sets, could be log files, could be images. That's all what source code is about, right? Maybe like one uh, thing I wanna highlight here. So, um, Data as input is clear, right? So Frederique with her um, uh, donation campaigns, she has like a new data set every, I don't know, six months or something that she wants to put through her segmentation stage, right? But what about those arguments? This is a research, uh, uh, a researcher speaking here once again. So um, um, in research, sometimes you want to do robustness checks. So that means like, do your results hold if you exclude certain observations, if you, I don't know, increase your sample size, if you use a different model, things like that, right? So it's very inefficient of like building copies of your analysis script just with like different uh, data sets. So I use arguments sometimes um, to specify um, not only on what data things to be run, but maybe also on what algorithm stuff, uh, uh, things should be run. So all of my important algorithms are in one script and I pass an argument to that script telling the algorithm like, okay, uh, telling the script like what part of that script to run. And, um, in that way, you can very, you know, uh, easily um, check the certain things in your data, like setting these flags. So, but, you know, the general thing is the same thing. So you have inputs, transformation, outputs. Uh, examples are load data from the web and save um, uh, uh, locally as a CSV. Um, clustering um, could be like, you know, there's an argument. Um, and, and by the way, later, that's one of the, the things. In, in K-means clustering, I don't know whether you know that, but like you have to pre-specify the number of clusters that you want to obtain. So um, I can call my script like, you know, Python cluster.py 10, and then I'm going to get 10 clusters, right? And then I can loop over the script to, you know, uh, have like, I don't know, data sets with like five to like 15 clusters, and I can estimate my model and see where the fit is best and then pick that model or something like that, right? But you don't have to build like five scripts for that. You can just like pass an argument. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, and so what about raw data? We store that remotely and we use a, a variety of systems, which, you know, maybe parallel, uh, or maybe like mirror the world that, that you're in, in firms where you have data sitting on different, um, service or, or systems. So, um, uh, data can be stored on file-based systems like Amazon S3 or FTP servers. Maybe it just sits on Dropbox and drive. You may use databases like MongoDB or MySQL. Um, and uh, at TilburgScience.com, we have like a little code snippet. Uh, I think we call it the get data tool. Maybe I still have to post the link. I need to check. But um, that um, uh, allows you to flexibly integrate like various kind of data sources in your project. The key really is that um, the scripts pull data locally and then run stuff. So it's not like that they kind of live in a cloud and do things, but like our scripts, they're made in a way that, that everything will be built locally on your computer or, you know, you may rent a computer in the cloud and put our workflows on there. That's fine. But like everything happens on that computer. Um, and um, something that may be of interest to you guys too is to check out our readme template. Um, so if you click on this in the slides, but you can also browse the slides, we have like a few um, uh, templates that you can use to, describe the data that you're generating in your project. And I'm very enthusiastic about those that, because like even just like two months after I generated files, for example, I, well, like a year ago, I generated a data set for, for a PhD student of mine. She's working on this data for now. And at that time, I didn't know yet about this cool readme. I put it up recently actually. So, uh, you know, and now we're like, ah, how is this data prepped again? And these questions in this template, um, they are very, very good. And, and they help you 
um, to have like um, a very good explanation of what that data is. Filling it in may take some time, um, you know, um, but uh, it forces you really to document all the important things uh, very well. So, um, for example, um, uh, a few things that I want to highlight, which um, I think are nice, are like very good details about the collection process. I mean, you know, sometimes you're collecting data and there are hiccups in the data collection or um, you used a specific seed to start to collect your data. So you did some sampling before you actually started to collect the data. And it's important that you tell future users of your data set what that is. And by the way, that future user may be you. You know, it's not that you have to document it for anybody else, but maybe you just have to do it for your future self. And um, um, uh, another good section is like, was there any pre-cleaning of this data done in any way? Uh, what is it that you think the data should be used? Um, that's important for future users of the data. You know, maybe there are certain conditions that make this data set unusable for others. So um, I actually ran student projects with this, where students created their own data sets and documented their data. And I find this extremely useful. Um, and, and I do that for, with my own data sets too. And then you have generated files, um, which are output files of your code. Um, and I want you to distinguish between a couple of those, like, um, you know, final, out, final files of your scripts, like the final product, like a final data set or a final table. We'll put them in output. If they're temporary, we'll put them in temporary folders. And if they're used for auditing, that is like kind of checking on whether your code, you know, did things good, we'll put them in an audit folder. And last notes, we like actually haven't found a good system. So if you have a better one, let me know. We just keep a Dropbox folder or a Drive folder or a Teams, whatever, uh, and have our documentation there. But code is the most essential building block in our projects. And this is like a nice framework that we've drawn up, which kind of puts these pipelines and components together. I know it's theoretical, but I'm going to code in a bit. So I hope I get good. some get others uh, excited about that too. So this is your pipeline. This is like the building blocks of your project, like prep data, uh, read final data set and prototype your model, estimate final model and whatever, do something in a paper. And they kind of cross with uh, our project components like raw data, source code, generated files. And like each of those steps in your project are independent of each other. So um, for instance, you can, I don't know, do some prototypical, uh, prototypical things uh, on your laptop, um, push your code base to GitHub and then the computer in your cloud pulls the most recent version of your GitHub repository, let's say every night or every two nights, and estimates using the most up-to-date algorithm that you've prototyped on a smaller data set on your laptop on a big cluster computer. And I use that for research. So I'm in, in the space where we, I have to do a revision for like, like an important journal, and we're still you know, working on the data, but we're also working on the analysis, and I'm running nightly builds of my projects. So whatever I did during the day, it's pulling that code at night and rebuilds the entire project. And then in the morning, the only thing I need to do is check my results because they're there um, um, or I can check errors if there were any problems in, in building my project. So in essence, it's not only that you can work in a team with this, but you can also just work with yourself like this because in today's world, uh, we are working on different computing systems. At least, I don't know, I, I have like three, four computers open at the same time. Uh, virtually. So um, this brings me to uh, the next important thing is like, how do you need to structure your, your, your directory structure? And, you know, there are many ways in which you can do this. We think we found one that works very well for us, but, you know, you, you're free to modify this. Um, there are some guiding principles here, and those principles are others should be uh, able to understand your pipeline merely by looking at the file and directory structure. And each step in the pipeline is self-contained. Uh, it should be portable because we want to be able to you know, port one stage of our pipeline to a cluster computer. And that project should just like build itself on that cluster computer. We don't want to spend like time configuring this thing. This should be done like automatically. Um, and um, yeah, project should be versioned and backed up using uh, um, GitHub. Um, so um, this is kind of the directory structure that we advocate, uh, which is inspired also by software engineers um, that, that do that to build software projects. So we have a source code folder. And for each source code folder, we are having a, a subfolder with a, um, a pipeline name. So for instance, our pipeline stage is data prep analysis paper. And then we're also having a, a folder with generated files. These are the output files of our source code. 
We never mix source code with output files because then you get to the mess that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture. And then we have, I don't know, like a mirror of some service structure with our raw data. Um, it's important that each of those um, uh, generated files that you bucket them um, according to these four categories, which is important. Input files, like any stuff that your source code needs to build stuff. Uh, any temporary files that are, you know, built in between, but that are not really important. By the way, you may love, but it's like especially important to like, I don't know, separate things that are unimportant from things that are important. And temporary files are clearly unimportant, but in the project structure I've shown you before, I'm unable to see what is important and what is not important. Think about, you know, long-term projects and audit files that allow you to assess whether your code ran uh, correctly. And um, we do this for every pipeline stage. Uh, you know, I, I told you at the beginning, this may sound like very simple, but actually when you start working with this, it helps you tremendously. And um, I know we just had like eight minutes left, so I'm not gonna go into all of these examples, but if you click on these links, you can see the directory structure of a more recent project I've been working on where we kind of took these that were we actually learned a lot about these things from 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 uh, colleagues with whom I was working at that time, and I think um, looking back at this directory structure, um, it looks way cleaner and um, yeah, it's it's much easier to share it also, and and people will be able to replicate it much easier. So uh, you know, if you look at these at these folders, they're like very clean and and you know no duplicate files and and all of that. So I think. Um, that should convince you already to to uh, look at this in the case. So, um, if you want to kickstart your project, we got a link in our slides um, where you can just like download a zip file, unzip, and then you have all the directories that we think are important in a project. Um, and then probably the most important thing today is about automation, and I'm showing you a bit about what that means with an example. Um, but before that, just like a definition. So. Um, we use build tools that are used by software engineers that um, incorporate, like have recipes on how to make stuff. And they work as follows. So they have like a target of what needs to be built. Um, they have a bunch of source files that they need uh, to, to know um, uh, uh, what is actually required uh, to make that build. And um, last they define on how that uh, build should actually be executed. That sounds very theoretical. Um, I will show you how that works and then you can look at tilburgsignsup.com to actually teach yourself these skills because I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I want to show you a bit of this fun. So um, uh, what you can do with this is like you build only what needs to be built. You can quickly move stuff to a new computer. You can move, loop through like different model specifications. Uh, you can execute nightly builds and I need to watch the chat because I got a couple of questions by Hans. Um, um, and Hans is asking, like, do you make actually an archive of your old work? Oh, yes, I do. So we have like systems in Tilburg, uh, well, like, like, like it's called Dataverse, where we can uh, store data or, or code. Um, and uh, certainly I have like full backups of, of, of these things uh, for archival purposes. But also our journals increasingly offer uh, a storage capacity for hosting of replication files. Um, so, um, and something actually, the other question is like, can you reproduce uh, uh, results uh, from like six to seven months ago. Yes, I can go back in my code base like automatically and then I can just click on run and that would replicate my results. That's like one thing, but also for historical projects, we're, we're storing the history of these things. So yes, that's, that's fully possible. And um, I will not show you this. Uh, I will just tell you we're using a tool called Make. This is one build tool, but there are many other build tools um, available. The sweet thing, thing is it's already installed on Mac and Linux systems, uh, but and you can easily install it for free on Windows. And I will show you this in practice in the remaining last, uh, you know, remaining five minutes. And I wanna encourage you actually to, uh, to do the things I do. And turns out what I'm showing you are the first few steps of the tutorial, but we have recorded the tutorial so you can follow it at your own pace after this uh, session. So um, I'm going to switch to Tilburg Science of the Cam right now, clicking on project templates and tutorial. This is a tutorial I actually built for my class on digital and social media analytics. And um, students, I wanted to familiarize students with these workflows, uh, but I also wanted to familiarize students with um, these, um, with text analysis actually, that's one part of this, this course that I'm teaching. 
okay? And in essence, this template um, is a reproducible GitHub um, uh, repository for text mining. So we share this repository in the folder structure that you would expect um, on this GitHub page. And you can find it easily by following these links. And this is an example of a reproducible research workflow that does a whole bunch of stuff. So it makes us JS, uh, it makes us Python with R, but it also applies certain concepts like downloading stuff from the internet, it unzipping data automatically, parsing JSON data to CSV files, uh, loading CSV files and enriching it with text mining metrics and then analyzing it and making like tables and figures. It does the thing, but it's a prototype, right? It's like not for a final paper. And you can actually um, clone this um, uh, thing on your systems. And you know, that's what, what our, um, that's what our um, uh, tutorial is about. So, and maybe that becomes a little geeky right now because I'm using the command line interface. And let me see whether I get my terminal up here, but where is my terminal? It's up here. So, um, but you know, I just want to get you excited about it. So what I'm doing is I'm cloning this, this workflow to my system which is thanks to it takes a copy of this entire workflow to my computer, right? It parallels the directory structure of what you've seen before. And now I can CD into this directory. So I access this directory and by only typing make, the whole project is being executed and I want you to watch it, right? So here's the status message of what's being done. So now it's downloading the data from a server that I pre-specified and um, that takes some time but also not too long, so I tested it before. And in here, you see the different software programs now communicating with each other. So this is Python downloading. Now it has downloaded the raw data into this data folder. And, oh, it's generating a bunch of things. It's already in the last pipeline stage where it executes some R code to like get tables and figures. But now we've built this entire generated things that I talked to you about, this analysis thing with output and temp files, data preparation with some temp files, and it did like everything automatically. If you go to gen analysis output, you'll also get the final results of your um, analysis. Um, and I need to put it on the right screen, which is here. And it's a rudimentary analysis, I admit, but it does something in R, you know, some histograms and stuff. And now you can start modifying this template to your needs by editing the source code. So um, there's is like, just like, um, let me uh, go to, sorry, let me go to the source code um, and just do like one thing here because I'm running out of time. Um, this is a file which uh, parses my data. I, I don't know. It's, it, it's technical. It like kind of transforms a JSON file, unstructured data to structured data. You can learn all about this in, uh, in this tutorial. But I build in a prototype condition here because I want this workflow to run very fast. That's, by the way, a very good thing that you should be using, prototyping like conditions, which like make your project a little smaller while you're working on it. So you can like iterate faster when you're editing code. And let's suppose I have like finalized prototyping my project. You can just like blank out this prototype condition and go back to uh, your text mining workflow and again, type make. And make has recognized that you've just edited this code file. It will not re-download your raw data because you didn't change anything with your raw data. And now it's parsing the uh, entire code base, uh, let's say the entire data that was collected here in this prototypical project. This is like, I don't know, 14,000 tweets about something. Um, and you can now look at the analysis, check those numbers. So I don't know, the mean was 2251. And if you just refresh, uh, you already see things have changed. Um, it's uh, you know now done on this big thing. So it went from prototyping to like let's say my productive thing with like everything in like just seconds, and that you can bring to scale with like many many things. Um, and we teach you about this um, in uh, in this tutorial. So I really encourage everybody to follow it. Also think about. Um, how you could change this template to make it a template that works for you in the particularly industry setting that, that you're in, because probably you're not doing text mining analytics and I don't know, downloading data from like Fortnite, which is a game which is popular among younger people. 
uh, than we are. So, you know, but take it as a framework to think about your projects. And we have a bunch of other templates coming to this page soon. Um, I meant to tell you about versioning, but uh, that's on the page anyways. And let me wrap up now with a little summary about what we have here. Um, so actually these are takeaways. Um, so manage your project as a pipeline, have logical pipeline stages that allows multiple people to work on the same project at the same time. It also allows you to port one stage of your pipeline to a different computer and have stuff running there while you're still prototyping in another stage. Store data, code, and generated files separately for each of those stages. Automate your entire pipeline. And, you know, I've just like spent five minutes on make what I maybe should have made this like, I don't know, 50 minutes um, because it's such a powerful tool. Um, so I hope that you, you uh, take my word for it. It will boost your productivity. And use our templates to kickstart your projects um, or make your own templates. And you can actually share those with us uh, later on. Um, how to get started? Don't be over ambitious, start gradually. If you are working on a joint Dropbox folder with like no good directory structure, maybe you just like unzip our directory structure template right now and start from that. That will, may already help. Um, and then use our project templates to learn from um, and, and build your skills here. Uh, again, we have a bunch of tutorials coming. There is one tutorial you fully recorded. And last, there's a, a housekeeping checklist. Um, actually, this is a checklist I developed together with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 some, some, some students, also colleagues, which is like, um, which helps you kind of, you know, there's a bunch of things that you can do to make you efficient, but you, you can use this checklist to like, I don't know, go uh, through your different folder structures and kind of see whether, uh, um, to what extent you have implemented our, our guide, uh, guidelines here. Um, let me go back to my deck uh, to wrap up. Uh, it's an open science project, uh, so you can contribute uh, to our site. Um, uh, uh, if you click this link or just you know, browse our page, you'll find how you can do that. We appreciate any contributions. Um, and um, we appreciate if you share the site with others. Um, we build it predominantly for you know, our teams because we found ourselves you know, explaining these things over and over again to like every new generation of students that we, that, that, that we were teaching to or that we were working with. And, and now we have this and, and we're happy to throw it out there uh, for other people to use. So I hope you find it useful uh, given that not many people defected from our stream, uh, I think you did find it useful. So um, uh, Sujay asked the question, is prototyping the same as subsetting a sample data set? Yeah, I mean, the way I've shown it, yes, that was prototyping, but um, you could also think about different algorithms um, and that's also prototyping. So yeah, there are many ways in which you can prototype your stuff and you can use make for all of this. Uh, that's it. Um, I'm sticking around for some questions. I can understand if some people are leaving. Um, I have a reputation for going over time. Sorry for that. Um, but no problem, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was great. Uh, as a chaotic person, I really love the structure that you're giving us. Uh, for all of you who are listening, this is recorded, so it will be on the knowledge kit for the online Tilburg University magazine. We'll share it there. And hopefully more people uh, are going to make use of your great uh, project, Thomas. I really like it. Any questions? Let's, let's hang around a bit and people can open up their mic and see if you want to talk to us. Yeah, cool. It's not my initiative. So we're building this with many people. And uh, actually it's also not, nothing that we like invented from scratch. We learned from many people and you know, there were some few PDFs with some thoughts, but there was never like this interactive website. So that's kind of what we built. That's where we take credit, but um, it's built on the shoulders of many other people. So just great. be humble here. <laughs> great, sounds great. And by the way, guys, it's good to, it's good to, it's good to see that, that you learn things. It's, it's good to see your reactions in the, in the, the chat. Yeah, and if you have any comments that you want to uh, like address to me, uh, this is my, the, my contact details. You can find like a contact form there or just my email address, whatever. So uh, yeah. There's a question, uh, Hannes. Yes, uh, are you also making use of MLOPs tooling to track and reproduce your experiments? Actually, I need to say, I don't know what that is. So that's good because I can learn from you. What is that? Uh, yeah, you, you saw it maybe recently, uh, 
appearing, uh, tools like ML Flow, where you can, for every experiment run that you're doing, just uh, record all your results, your accuracy, but also your hyperparameters, which data set you use, stuff like that, just to keep track uh, yes. of all the things that you've been doing and that you can get back to. So I was wondering. Sweet, sweet, sweet. I love it. I don't. And I, 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 um, I um, kind of made a sketch of this tool in my head that I wanted to build it because I didn't spend time actually checking out whether this is there. So um, awesome that you put this in the chest. No, I don't use this tool, but yes, I want to use this tool. Um, that's, that's amazing. Any other tips I want to learn from you guys? <laughs> Uh, so let me see. Um, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, in, so the question is, in my area, do uh, reviewers actually try to reproduce your results? So um, in my experience, the journal editors do, or let's say the, the manage, managing staff at the journal. So when I submitted my replication files, they're running it and they check whether the, the, the numbers match up. Um, I, as a reviewer, do things at times. So um, sometimes, actually, when I see things that don't make sense, I write like a little R script to make like a little simulation and I share the code with the authors to point out some mistakes. So, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, short question, uh, short answer to this. Journal editors do. And in the review process, it's, uh, it's you know, becoming more. But, um, and yes, I've used Git LFS uh, to versioning large files. I don't think um, large files in the order of magnitude that I use should be versioned. Um, so I'm generating temp files in the magnitude of, I don't know, terabytes. And you need these files to run your workflows but it is extremely costly in terms of data storage to keep copies of each and every temp file that I build on the way. So actually I need to say I strictly oppose versioning um, these temporary files and output files, all those generated files, they should just conceptually not be versioned because if you did a good job, your code plus your raw data reproduces each and every single version of these files. Um, do I use Git LFS? In general, yes, I do. Uh, in smaller projects, I version, uh, let's say I, I store my raw data, um, but uh, like for my bigger empirical projects for research, I always have external servers where I have that. Like, uh, like yeah, I, I hope that's a good answer to you, to your question. Um, uh, Tim, if not, let me know. The thing is like with Git LFS, you also don't have control and then suddenly you hit like a paying threshold. It's very transparent. You can then you can configure your own server, but like, okay, conceptually generated files should not be versioned in my humble opinion. Good. Okay. Well, everyone, Good. don't forget that next week we have uh, Professor Kuno Hausmann on decision-making under uncertainty. And for now, Hans, really thank you very much uh, for joining us and giving us these insights on the Tilburg Science Hub. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining.